I grew up on an island called Rendover in the Solomon Islands, which was completely isolated due to the lack of modern technology. I lived with my grandmother, who was considerate and able to talk to spirits. Many strange things happened whilst I was growing up, but this is the most vivid story I can remember. We had a little farm to grow our cassava and taro, and my grandmother and I went up nearly every day to work on it and harvest food for dinner. I was only around four years old at the time, but I was my grandmother's little helper. At one point my grandmother noticed that there were some of our crops missing and decided to plant our ancestral ginger there. The ginger, as weird as it sounds, is said to have a demon we use to sacrifice the inside of it to protect us. She planted it there to ensure whoever was stealing our crops would get caught. One afternoon, we're sitting at our leaf hut and this man comes down from the path of our little farm. He is shivering and mind you, this is the Pacific so it is extremely hot. He is very disoriented and my grandmother at this point realised that he's the one who stole our crops and decides to help him and hopefully he will learn his lesson. She orders me to make a fire and I start making one while she goes and gets the man and sits him down next to it. He is still shivering right next to the fire. So I go fetch a blanket and cover him, but he is still cold. My grandmother and I sit next to him and she starts talking to him, but not talking to him. She says something along the lines of, it's time to come out now, leave him alone. I'll never forget how the man replied. It was the most demonic, low sounding voice I had ever heard in my life. And the man replied with, I don't want to come out, he's mine now. So at this point I'm beyond scared and my grandmother tells me to get my uncles to come and hold him down. I go and get them and they hold the man down. My grandmother then starts doing a pulling motion just above the man's body and he begins to scream. My grandmother keeps going regardless and repeats the process for about half an hour. Eventually the man collapses and my grandmother says she has to go into the forest to finish the rest of the ritual. She instructs me to stay with the man until he wakes up and once he does to give him some stew. The man wakes up a little later and is completely confused as to where he is. I ask him if he remembers anything, and he said he remembers intense pain. I send him off on his way back to his home village, and my grandmother comes back a bit later with the ginger she has to plant. Nevertheless, the man learned his lesson, and he never stole from us again. Firstly, I would like to state that I am an atheist and tend to remain sceptical when it comes to the supernatural or paranormal, but there have been a handful of events that have occurred in my life that science or rational thought simply cannot explain. One such moment occurred in July of this year. Just for context, I'm a 23 year old male, originally from the north of England but now I'm currently living in the West Midlands. During the event of this experience, I was house sitting with my boyfriend. They had quite a large amount of land and were in the middle of nowhere. And by nowhere, I mean the middle of a forest, on the top of a hill and surrounded by mountains and caves. Our friend and her husband had gone on holiday, but due to having quite a lot of land and a very large, ostentious home and a lot of animals to look after, there was work that needed to be done. I didn't mind though, as I had already lived in the countryside and because of my boyfriend's work I'm usually home alone anyway, so I don't mind the isolation all that much. I imagined it would be fun to explore the woods, play with the animals on the farm and even go exploring in some of the caves nearby 
as they were full of ruins and cave houses that were built during the Bronze Age or something. We were staying in the guest house and were tasked with making sure that the gardens were looked after, the yard was kept clean, the house itself was secure, and the six horses, five geese and two farm cats were all well looked after. Despite it being a lot of work, we were really enjoying ourselves. We took time to swim in the pool and binge watch Stranger Things on Netflix. However, my boyfriend has recently been promoted and was unfortunately called into work for the last few days of the week. He tried to make himself available so that he could help me with some of the other jobs before he left in the afternoon. But on the Friday, I had to do all of the chores by myself. So after feeding the horses, I put the geese back in their shed, making sure they had water and food, and I noticed the two farm cats were acting very strange. Harry and Jack, despite being tough farm cats, had the nicest disposition ever. They were really friendly, but now they were stood by one of the big gates on the yard, hissing. All of a sudden they stopped hissing and climbed back into their little wooden house seemingly for the night. After locking these geese in their huts and making sure it was secure against the local foxes, I went over to the big yard gate and tried to peep out of this massive barbed wire gate to see if there was anyone outside, but there was nothing. In truth I didn't expect to see anyone, because the house itself was in the middle of the forest and the hills, pretty much in the middle of nowhere like I said before and the nearest village is at least a 20 minute drive away. But anyway, I just chalked it up to the cats behaving oddly and up to a naughty fox trying to sneak in. But I couldn't help but feeling a little freaked out. After giving the cats some food and water, I locked them in their little cat house just to make sure they wouldn't be brawling with that fox. Once I did that, I had one last check of the horses in their field. As I was doing it though, I got this odd sense, like someone was watching me. I could have chalked it up to paranoia, but then all of a sudden these two horses let out a shrieking cry and bolted. I felt both confused and very worried, as the normally very placid horses rushed out of the field and hid inside their shelters. When I made my way back down through the field, I discovered that all of the horses were doing exactly the same thing. Four horses in this field were all hiding in their shelter in the corner of the field. This was really weird. I'd spent every hour of the day for a week observing these animals and looking after them. They had never acted like this before. I even considered calling my boyfriend back, but I couldn't help but feeling I was overreaching. As I was finishing tidying the yard, I switched on the electric fences and made my way back to the guest house. It was getting cold and it was somewhat soothing. We had experienced a week of scorching Spanish weather, so a little breeze and shade was actually quite nice. So the breeze then turned to gale and the grey clouds above me went black, really black, as black as night. I remember feeling really strange as I looked up at the sudden tempest skies, the heavens unleashed, and I rushed down the garden path back to the guest house, which was situated next to the electronic gate and just across from the main house. As I closed the door, I felt a lot safer. And then I thought to myself, safer? Safe from what? I had no idea why I was freaking out so much. I told myself to stop being stupid and kept telling myself people of my age shouldn't get worked up over nothing. So I opened the guest house door and proceeded to tidy up the wheelbarrows away and lock up the garage, which was handily connected to the side of the guest house with its roof sheltering me from the rain. Then another nasty wind whipped up and down the path leading up to the garden, startling not just me, but all of the birds who were nesting in the bush at the time. Their unexpected and frantic screeching was enough for me. I slammed the garage door shut, locking it quickly and scrambled back into the guest house. Now all the time we had been staying there, we never, 
locked the door to the guest house. I guess we just felt safe behind the big high walls and electronic gates. I now see that it was a foolish thing to think. Yet something about tonight made me want to lock the door. Perhaps it was because of the weather, or the strange behaviour of the animals. Or maybe it was the notion that my boyfriend, the only person who knows I'm out here and could help me, won't be back until about 3 in the morning. Regardless, something about tonight made me feel that the simple wooden door and its easily smashable glass windows were all the protection I had. So I locked the door from the inside and kept the keys in my pocket. Sitting down on the sofa, I turned on the television and began watching my favourite soap opera to take my mind off my irrational fears. However, every now and again, my eyes would just veer away from the television and gaze out at the very large windows, looking out across the gravelly front yard and the distant, drain-wrenched garden. I didn't know why I kept looking out of the windows, but in hindsight, I think it was my instinct telling me to do so to keep watch, because something was coming. Evening turned to night, and I allow a tired yawn as I watched the lights around the yard automatically come on. I looked out down past the kitchen and out the glass of the door to see the patio light turn on as it had always done. I know it seems silly, but the idea of being surrounded by light made me feel safe. Nothing can hide in the light. It seems like light was able to banish away all bad things, all the bogeymen in closets, all the monsters under the bed. It could even get rid of a nightmare. And now, I was safe, surrounded by my lights. But again, very stupid. All of a sudden, a loud knock rapped upon the guest house door, almost causing me to jump out of my skin. I looked over to the door. But the patio light had gone out making it very difficult to see anything. Feeling really frightened, I turned the television off and looked out the living room window to check that the electronic gates were still shut, which they were. I kept thinking that maybe my imagination had gotten the better of me, and my fear had just made me believe that I heard the knocking at the door. However, any doubt I had washed away in seconds. A more firmer knock rattled across the glass on the door. Utter disbelief to cold, and I could feel myself leave my body. That is how shocked I was. I mean, this isn't the middle of a street of an estate. It's the middle of nowhere. For a moment, I sat there listening to the rain drumming down on the window of the guest house, and with a deep breath, I stood up, stepping towards the kitchen and the front door. To my shock and surprise, on the other side of the glass door were two young boys. They looked about 12 to 14, and the dark hoodies they wore were absolutely soaked from the rain, as if they'd been standing out there the entire night. They looked pale and cold, and a surge of humanity and compassion swept over me, causing me to almost make a massive mistake. I rushed over to the door and went to open it, fearing that the children may be injured or lost, or both. But then it suddenly dawned on me, where did they come from? And how did they get in without me opening the electronic gates? I withdrew my hand from opening the door, and the two boys looked up at me from behind the glass, with most of their face still shrouded behind their hoods. Please let us in. We went for a walk and got lost in the woods. The taller and more mature one spoke. His words seemed more calculating and smooth than what a child's should be. We're cold and scared, the smaller boy whimpered. His words pulled on my heartstrings, and I really worried for them. But then again I reminded myself, this wasn't possible. So I summed up all my courage and all my breath, and I asked the children a question. Where did you come from, and how did you get in here? The gate was open. We saw the light, and we rushed over. Please can we come in out of the cold? We just wish to call our parents. They must be worried sick. The taller boy exclaimed this, with his well-composed words luring me towards the door. Again, I found myself believing the words of the more mature boy, 
and I almost believed his explanation before I suddenly realised that the gates had been closed since my boyfriend had left. Only we were in possession of the remotes used to open the gates, and I knew that they hadn't been opened. You're lying. The gates have been shut all night. I never saw you come in, so where did you come from? I called out. The two boys looked up at each other, and what happened next sent a shiver down my spine. They turned their heads to look behind them, and there, down the garden path, was an even taller boy emerging from the darkness. His long slender form seemed to drift through the bushes and trees that hung over the little pathway. Like the others, he was wearing a dark hoodie, and his spindly hands were cold white. What little I could see of his face was just like the two smaller boys, pale and ghostly. I shuddered, and the whole kitchen went cold. I could literally see my breath, and I felt more terror from these young boys than I've ever felt from anything else in my entire life. I know it seems crazy, but there was something about their voices and their near identical clothing. It just wasn't normal. It was like they were trying to appear as normal and as human as they could, but lacked some sense of identity and uniqueness that all humans have. As the older boy approached, I realised he was as tall as me, and he stood between the two haunting children. I took a step back. Please let us in. It's cold and dark and we're frightened, the taller boy said. Weirdly, his voice still sounded particularly young and childlike, but it just didn't seem normal. I stepped a little further. Come on, Connor. Let us in. We can't come in unless you say it's okay. The older and more dominating of the three boys called this out, and my eyes widened in disbelief and let out a gasp as I felt my whole body shiver with fear, and my heart threatened to stop. How could they know my name? That's impossible. This sort of stuff doesn't happen in real life. And hoping that all of this was some kind of hallucination or my imagination gone wild. I closed my eyes for a moment and hoped that they would be gone. But the moment I opened my eyes, they were still there. Get out of here. I'm, I'm going to call the police. My last words not carrying any form of strength. They wouldn't get here in time. You're in the middle of nowhere, all alone with us. The tallest boy said, and the two small ghostly boys giggled. Their hideous giggling and hayless laughter sent fear rocketing through me. I could feel my eyes being filled with terror. They still kept laughing, and I saw their teeth were as black as charcoal. Go away! Leave me alone, I cried out. But the boys suddenly stopped laughing and pushed their faces up against the glass door. I let out another gasp. Their eyes. Their eyes were black. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I knew that these three phantoms were not children. Whatever these creatures were with their eyes like midnight and their festering grins, they were not human. And worse than that, they were thoroughly enjoying terrorising me. You're going to die in there. The smaller boy sniggered. At that, I let out a yelp and ran into the living room. I slammed the kitchen door shut and pushed one of the living room chairs up against it. I kept fearing that the simple wooden door would not keep them out as I staggered back upstairs towards the bedroom. But I could still hear them, giggling and taunting me. I could feel my heart thumping and the sense of fight or flight was taking hold but I couldn't fight. Whatever those things were, I couldn't run away either. Where could I go? If somehow I escaped into the woods? I dreaded to think what else could be lurking out there. Or what if I managed to escape to get to the horse fields? Would I be safe with them? I doubted it. And what if I was outside, and there was more than three of them? I wrestled with my chances and choices. I suddenly realised that I couldn't hear them anymore. My eyes caught glance of something pale, and I saw them standing on the other side of the living room window. Each of the three children stood in front of one of the large windows grinning at me. I wanted to run over and shut the blinds, but my feet wouldn't move. 
When they finally did, I ran for the bathroom. The only room in the guest house with a lock, locking myself inside. I sat in the shower with the lights off, hoping that they would just leave. As I lay there, praying to every god, angel, demon and deity I could think of, but none of them answered or came to my aid. It was like the boy said, I was alone. For hours I stayed there, listening to the boys as they continued to yell, Let us in. Let us in. It seemed like it would never end until suddenly and abruptly it did. I couldn't hear them anymore. And after about 30 minutes of pure silence, I summoned up what courage I had left and peeked out of the bathroom. The boys were now gone from the living room window. So seeing my chance, I ran over and shut the blinds, then wondered if they had gone back to the front door. So again, I took a deep breath and pushed the chair aside and opened the kitchen door. They weren't there anymore either and the patio light was on again. They were gone. However, I took no relief from their disappearance, for even knowing if they were gone physically, I couldn't help feel as though they were still lurking somewhere down the garden path, watching me from the shadows, and just waiting for me to let my guard down, to jump out and begin terrorising me anew. For the rest of the night, I sat up, with all the lights on, and the big kitchen knife in my hand, waiting for my boyfriend to come back. When morning came, I heard the gates open, and my eyes were heavy, and I was exhausted. But the sound filled me with a wave of energy. I rushed over to the front door, unlocking it, and sprinted over to him. In a frantic ramble, I tried to tell him what happened, and despite him saying he believed me, I could see that he didn't. Why would he? I was on edge the rest of my time there. I couldn't sleep properly, and every time we were back on the field or in the gardens, I could sense their eyes on me. The following day, nothing happened, and the owners returned. I wanted to tell them what I had experienced, as they were good friends of ours, but I didn't want to freak them out or sound a little crazy, so I kept it to myself. We had breakfast with them, and one of the owners, who we will call Steph, told us of how much of a good job we'd done, and asked if we had enjoyed it, which I replied with a reluctant yes. Then her mood changed and her eyes looked worried as she asked us if there was any problems. I assumed by problem she meant the animals. She looked at me and asked, did anyone try to break in? I could feel what she was about to say before she even said it and I knew I didn't want to hear it. I would prefer my experience with those boys just to be a hallucination or the onset of madness. But I knew from the look in her eyes that she was going to tell us otherwise. Steph said the last few times they went on holiday, they would come home and find footage on their CCTV of three boys knocking at their doors late at night and calling out for someone to let them in. They had police search the grounds and the surrounding area, but there were no signs of a break-in. And in truth, there were no signs that the boys had ever existed. I told her about my experience and she seemed genuinely unnerved. And my boyfriend, who is as sceptic as they come, apologised for not believing me. They asked me if we'd ever house it for them again, and without hesitation I said no. I never wanted to cross paths with those strange boys and their midnight eyes. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if it had not been me in the guest house, but someone more trusting. I wonder what might have happened to them. I can imagine, I imagine, I would not be here writing this account if I had done so. I don't know who or what they were, or where they came from. All I know is that they weren't normal. They're real, and I will never forget my visitation from the three black-eyed children. My sister had just finished a movie, when I decided it was too late to be up, so I went to bed. But my sister was up for another two hours. I woke up at least two times during the night. The first time I woke up by my mother, and the second time by my sister. The last time I went back to sleep, I felt strange and uneasy. To my surprise I woke up, but I knew I wasn't awake. I then looked down to see where my sister was sleeping, and saw this pitch black eyed creature. I was able to move for a mere second and pick up the nearest thing to try and hit the creature, and suddenly, I fell to my hands and knees behind my neck. And then I heard two voices. 
One said to stop, that you're hurting him. It sounded like a female. And the male voice said, who cares? I was then put back on my bed and saw a demonic figure in front of my curtain closet. It slightly moved and I screamed. But my brother who was right beside me heard nothing. I was then upright and woke up that way only to see the curtain sliding back down and then rushed off the bed and saw the weirdest thing. The doors that I had locked twice for the night were all open and I woke up at exactly 3.33am, said to be the devil's hour. It recently happened to me and I'm afraid to be up without the lights to help me sleep. This is easily the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me and it is not something I hope happens to anyone else. When I was a teenager, I lived in my father's basement. He would frequently go on business trips and I would be left alone in the house for up to weeks at a time. One evening in spring, I woke up alone watching TV around 2am when I heard through the open window what sounded like two distinct set of footsteps outside, walking from around the front yard to the side and then the backyard when they stopped. It was then that I realised since all my lights were out, I couldn't see outside, but the outside could see me. I immediately panicked, shutting off my TV and lights. So now I was alone in my basement with no lights on and what I thought were two prowlers sitting on my back deck. I don't know how long I was frozen in the darkness for, but after I didn't hear any more sounds for a while, I quietly crept upstairs to try and get a better look at my backyard. Thankfully, all the lights upstairs were already off. Unfortunately, with the way the bushes and patio umbrella were set up, there was a large blind spot. I considered calling 911, but when my father inevitably found out, I would know for sure that I'd have to be forced to stay with my aunt whilst he was out of state. So I stared at that deck waiting to see movement for at least 10 minutes before I began convincing myself that my mind was playing tricks on me and I decided to go out to investigate. I grabbed the closest weapon I could find, an old shepherd's axe, and went out the front door and crept around the side of my house. Crouching behind a bush, I finally mustered the courage to swing the axe into the bush and shout hey. Nothing would happen, right? No one was there, right? And I'd have a good laugh, albeit an embarrassed one, when I realised I was just being paranoid. Instead, I immediately hear the sound of deck chairs scraping on wood and two sets of human footsteps running off in the opposite direction. My heart stopped. I felt like I blacked out for a second from the adrenaline rush. I ran back around the side of the house in the direction where I came. What was I supposed to do? There was no time to think. I made it to my front door, swung it open and rushed inside and then slammed it shut and stood there in the darkness, practically hyperventilating. I stared out into the street, waiting for someone leaving the property, but no one did. It was then that I realised that now I wasn't safe inside my own house like I thought I would be. I was trapped. So I ran to the front door in the middle of the street where I could scream if I saw someone. Surely by now I could have called the cops, but I wasn't clearly thinking anymore, if I ever was. Now I was facing my house, but I still didn't see anyone. So I glanced down to the street. Nothing. Then I looked right. Two male figures were walking by me, a block and a half down the street. Just as soon as I noticed them, they turned left at the T-junction on the main road and disappeared out of sight. For some reason I ran after them, and when I turned the corner no one was there. They should have been there, and they could have only made about half a block from where they were walking. They must have had a car waiting. I was 13. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Wow, that second story was long, but really creepy. And many thanks to the subscribers who submitted their stories. It really is appreciated. And speaking of appreciation, something I would profoundly appreciate 
is if you could like and share this video. Remember you can email me your creepy experience to my email found in the description below. But just remember to give me your consent to use it though. And don't forget, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter for updates and behind the scenes. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. Can we speak to the entity we spoke to in the other house? The planchette moved to yes. Are you the same entity that's following her around? Yes. At this point I wanted proof. I wanted something solid that I could take away from this experience and say, without a doubt, that there is something beyond our understanding and point to this as proof, at least to myself.